Episode 146. Sponsored by Rainier Ballistics, Hodgton Powders, and JPL Precision. Welcome to Power Factor. I'm Rick, and as those of you who are fans of IDPA probably know, the new rule book that came out a couple of months ago uh, took effect August or pff, October 1st. And so now we're into the new rule book era of IDPA, and there are some changes. Some of them are significant. Uh, I think that will, the, they will make a big difference in how the sport is played. Um, some of the others, uh, as many as they are, a lot of them were just adding clarifications that had been made already into the rule book, kind of integrating those clarifications into the rule book so that they weren't scattered around, oh yeah, I know what that new rule is because it's posted on the forum, or I know what it is because I have a letter from Robert Ray, you know, all those past uh, clarifications have been integrated, but there's also been some detail changes, and we are going to do, I suspect, multiple episodes on equipment and the safety rules, the competition rules, but I just thought I'd start uh, with the equipment rules, which um, I think affect people if you're if you like to play the game kind of on the edge of what's legal. Um, there are some changes that you can take advantage of as a competitor. Um, most of them are relaxing, I would say, restrictions uh, from uh, the rules that affected the weapons used in the sport. Uh, so we're just gonna, gonna go over that. So consider this the first actual new rule book uh, episode of uh, Power Factor Show. So I'm just going to go through the different divisions and we'll just uh, discuss some of the details. Um, first in uh, a fire, the general rules have an interesting change to the mag capacity uh, rules in that the, the lower the capacity of the magazines you're using, the more you're allowed to carry. And we saw that in the revolver divisions uh, a couple of years ago when they allowed you to carry three reloads rather than two. Um, kind of uh, acknowledging that the lower capacity of the six shot revolver means you've only got 18 rounds in your gun at the start of a course of fire if you're only allowed two reloads. So the rules were modified if you're shooting a revolver, you can carry three reloads. Well now that kind of allowance for lower capacity has been extended into the auto pistol divisions as well. So if you're starting the course of fire with eight or more rounds in the gun, the rule stays the same as it used to be, you're allowed two additional loading devices. So that would be the, the two, say, magazines that you're carrying on your weak side. If you have six or seven rounds, you can carry three additional reloads. So that would be, for instance, um, mo I think most of the guns that would be affected by, like, by that rule would be compact 1911 45s um, that have a six or seven shot capacity. So you're, you're now allowed to carry a third mag. If you're starting with five or fewer rounds in all loading devices, you can carry four reloads. And I think where that's going to come into play is if, for instance, we'll, we'll get into a, another new rule um, that expands the types of guns you're allowed to carry, and that will include guns uh, such as five-shot revolvers. So I think this, this rule anticipates uh, the use of five-shot revolvers or low-capacity auto pistols in competition, and so you can carry four, up to four reloads if you've got uh, five, or, five or fewer rounds in your, in your gun. So that, that'll work out. I, I like any of these rules that sort of encourage the carrying of real defensive guns. I mean, I think when you go to a match, you see a lot of uh, full-size 1911s and uh, the biggest guns that are legal, um, making allowances for lower capacities, I think encourages people to use real carry guns, and so I think that's a good idea. Um, the unserviceable firearm rule, this is something that uh, I, I, was, I welcome this. Um, it used to be if your gun broke, if it was determined that you couldn't continue with the firearm that you were using, you would have to replace it with a gun that was almost identical to the one that was, had broken. And I think that's really uh, 
it's a really rough rule for people to come up with a spare gun that's identical to the one that they were using. Um, unless you're really in hardcore into competition and have a lot of spare equipment, who has two guns of the same type? I mean, let's say my Glock 17 breaks, how likely is it I'm going to have another Glock 17 to complete the match with? And so the new rule is that any same division legal gun may be used. And so, for instance, if your Glock 17 broke, you could shoot your Glock 19, or you could shoot your Beretta 92 or something. Anything that's legal in the same division in which you're competing is a suitable replacement. So I think that's great, because I think there's a lot of people that have, say, two guns that are both SSP legal. And so this way, if one breaks, you can use the other one. You don't have to worry about borrowing a gun identical to the other one that you already were shooting. So that's a great, that's a great uh, change, and it affects all the divisions it's across the board. Uh, legal modifications for all divisions. Um, magazine disconnectors may be remo removed or disabled. Uh, previously, magazine disconnectors were considered a safety device. You couldn't disable it or remove it. Um, some time ago, again, it was one of those deals where there was a clarification and update, but now it's been integrated into the rule book. So if you have a magazine disconnector, and what that is is a little mechanical device inside the gun that when the magazine is removed, uh, it disables the trigger mechanism. So you must have a magazine in the gun to shoot it. And in IDPA, where it kind of becomes a hassle is on the unload and show clear, you're supposed to remove the magazine, show that the gun is clear, and pull the trigger. Well, for a gun with a magazine disconnector in place to work, you would have to reinsert an empty magazine, pull the trigger, then then get the other magazine out. And there's no range commands to cover, insert the empty magazine, now remove the empty magazine. And so just by allowing people to disable those uh, magazine disconnectors, um, it solves that problem. And then it also solves the problem of having otherwise identical guns within a certain model range where one is equipped with the disconnector and the other isn't. So a guy comes to the line, he needs a magazine to drop the hammer on his gun, another guy doesn't. Both guns are legal, and the only difference is the presence of this disconnector. And I think it finally you know, became pretty obvious that the disconnector isn't really much of a safety device, and so disabling it or removing it doesn't affect the safety of competition, but it makes things flow easier, and you avoid issues with these guns that are almost identical, but for this disconnector feature. And that, again, is across all divisions. Uh, lasers. Uh, the rule book was very specific. Lights were not allowed. Um, we, me, I, I took a, a light to mean not just visible light, but a laser light. You could not have an attached laser on your gun, strictly speaking. But generally, I think at uh, what would now be considered a tier one match, that's another thing that's uh, in the new rule book, is um, uh, they've divided local club matches and regional and national championships into different tiers that have different requirements, somewhat similar to USPSA in their, their system of grading uh, the different levels of matches. Um, at, a, at our local matches, we would usually let somebody leave their laser grips attached to their gun as long as they didn't turn the laser on and use the laser and as long as the lid of the box would close on the gun with the grips in place we figured no harm no foul and that essentially is what the new rule is you may shoot your gun with a laser attached as long as all the other rules uh, are accommodated so you you have to make weight um, you can't turn the laser on and it, uh, although it doesn't specifically say it has to fit in the box, it does say all other division rules. So that would mean uh, for the auto pistol divisions, it's got to fit in the box. So that's kind of cool. I think there's, uh, again, encouraging people to use their real carry gun, uh, allowing the lasers, not requiring somebody to take their laser grips off or remove an integrated laser system from the gun for competition, I think is a good idea. And again, that's across all divisions. Um, now let's get into the, each of the individual divisions, starting with stock service pistol. And there are detail changes that I'm not going to talk about uh, because I don't really see how they're, they don't really affect anything. I mean, they're, 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 they're putting something in writing that I think everybody kind of understood already. Uh, so I'm not going to go over just changes in wording that really have no uh, effect on, on the competition. I'm just going to go over the changes that actually affect the shooter and things that you might want to be able to take advantage of if you're shooting in that division. So in stock service pistol, uh, by far I think the biggest change is allowing all striker fired pistols in SSP. Um, there were some striker fired pistols that were uh, just because of kind of, I don't know, kind of a, a sense of mechanical advantage based on how the mechanism was set up in the gun. 
they were relegated to ESP even though they were striker fired. And so the prime example of that would be the Springfield XD. The mechanism is very similar, almost identical to what you find in say the M&P or the Glock. Um, but it was determined at some level that it was a single action gun, so it was relegated to ESP. Now it's been uh, moved into SSP and I think a lot of people really welcome that change. Um, lots of XDs around and now that expands their ability to shoot. The other gun that it comes into play Kind of an interesting case, I think when IDPA was formed in 96, one of the few striker fired guns on the market that was allowed in SSP was the HKP7. And it's known uh, primarily for the squeeze cocking feature. Here on the front strap, the act of squeezing the gun essentially cocks the mechanism. And so initially, um, it was in SSP, but I think somebody decided, well, if squeezing the grip cocks the mechanism, you're actually getting a single action first shot, and single action first shots belong in ESP. So they moved the gun to ESP, um, and now it's been put back into SSP uh, via this new rule that makes all striker-fired guns uh, SSP legal. So if you're shooting that uh, P7, you're now good to go in SSP. Uh, welcome rule change there. Uh, they've also changed the weight limit. This, I think, is another uh, welcome change. We used to essentially have a different weight limit in every division. Uh, and now the auto pistol divisions are all 43 ounces across the board. I think uh, SSP, SSP was, I think, 36 ounces. ESP was 43 ounces. CDP was 41. Then it was increased to 42. Now they're all 43 across the board. And I think that, caught, that, that solved some issues. Um, one of the rules that's been in place for a while is that any gun that's legal for stock service pistol is also legal for enhanced service pistol, even if the gun is not legal for enhanced service pistol, which might sound kind of confusing. Where that came into play, I think most uh, often was in the case of the CZ SP01, which was an aluminum framed gun that had a full length dust cover that extended all the way to the barrel with a rail on it. And the rules for ESP do not allow the metal rail. I want to get this right. Doesn't matter if I've got it right. The problem was your SP01 was just slightly too heavy to get into SSP. So people were using special grips. They were using 10 round magazines because the mag bodies had uh, were plastic. Uh, half of the length was in plastic and half was in metal. So it was a little bit lighter. So you could get your 37 and a half ounce gun down to 36 ounces. That would make it SSP legal. So then it was also ESP legal. We've avoided that now. The 43 ounce weight limit means you don't have to try to find that, you know, two ounces of weight to take off your pistol uh, so that you can use it in ESP. So I think that's a good deal too because it was a real hassle. So 43 ounces across the board, all the divisions, um, all the auto pistol divisions. Um, not much else has changed. There's stuff, and we discussed little bits of this over the last couple of years on the show, things like stippling removable parts of the grip. Um, you know, you can put a grip sock on it. Some of this stuff isn't changes, but it's just stuff that's in the book that doesn't really, I think, affect too much how people are going to play the game. But if you want to, of course, check your rule book and see, uh, we're going to just kind of gloss over some of this stuff that isn't really uh, all that important, I don't think. There are some weight limits specified for various components and, uh, for instance, grips. You can change your grips, uh, but they can't weigh more than two ounces more than stock. You can change your magazine base pads, but they can't weigh more than an ounce more than stock, that kind of stuff. Um, just to, I think uh, the concern is adding weight to the gun. Um, there's rules that address adding weight. There's rules that address removing weight. Um, but in this case, they've just they've made, maybe become very specific by giving you weight limits. Um, you can use mags that are longer than stock. Uh, yeah. Enhanced service pistol division. And this is the division for guns um, that are uh, that that can be uh, carried cocked and locked, hammer fired, double action, single action. Um, uh, guns typically uh, something along the lines of the. Uh, the CZ 75 series SP01, Browning high power uh, 1911s, chambered in 9mm, that kind of thing. Uh, probably the most diverse group of guns you'll find in the sport or in ESP. 
you essentially have the small caliber low power factor of SSP with all the allowable changes of custom defensive pistol in one division. So you're seeing a lot of the striker fired guns that have been too heavily modified to be legal in SSP and then these kind of sub caliber versions of uh, big bore guns and whatnot. So a lot of diversity in the division. Um, and again, the mention here that all guns that are SSP legal or ESP, ESP legal. Um, details about uh, ability to add weight to the grips and the magazine base pads and that kind of stuff. Um, and then all the stuff that was in place before is still in place. I mean, here's a 38 Super 1911. Um, the rules uh, regarding the magazine release, it cannot be enlarged, uh, but it can be extended further from the frame, no more than 0.2 inch. Um, again, this isn't really a rule change, but it's just the details that the rule book goes into. Uh, they talk about the length of the trigger, how far the trigger protrudes. Um, there's at least three or four different lengths of trigger available for the 1911. I mean, you're, they're almost like industry standard, short, medium, and long. And now the rule book specifically addresses the length of the trigger that says you can use an aftermarket trigger that changes the reach, essentially, um, to the face of the trigger. Um, so you can, you're free to change that. You're free to change the hammer, uh, grip safeties, uh, mag wells, as long, again, as long as it fits in the box. You can change the sights. And a lot of this isn't new, but again, it's much more detailed about the, the weights and the diameters and the specifications. And I just think they address more things and make them specifically legal. Um, whereas before they were just kind of accepted as legal, people just ex expected that they could put whatever length trigger they wanted in their gun, but now it's uh, specifically legal. <clears throat> uh, what else do we have here? The usual stuff, you can make your gun more accurate, you can alter the trigger pull, that kind of stuff. Um, get into custom defensive pistol now. Again, they've re increased the weight. Uh, limit from 42 ounces to 43 ounces that gives you a little more leeway. Uh, I know back in the day uh, you had to be kind of selective about what kind of features you added to your gun if they added weight. So for instance popular items that you would put in a gun that it maybe didn't come with from uh, as stock would be a full length uh, metal guide rod which adds an ounce give or take. Um, a steel mainspring housing, uh, if you, the gun came stock with a plastic one, uh, you might add on a full magwell funnel that adds some additional weight. Even if it's aluminum, it adds a little bit of weight. And so it used to be you had to kind of pick and choose the features that you wanted on your gun because if you had the, let's say, a big steel magwell on your gun, you couldn't also have a full length steel guide rod in your gun and still make what originally was a 41 ounce weight limit. So now you're at 43 ounce weight limit in CDP. And so you have room to add more stuff on your gun if you like to add stuff. Or if it comes from the factory with all that stuff on it and it previously was too heavy, as long as you're at 43 ounces, you're okay. Uh, what else do we have here? <clears throat> um, this, I think, is a change. I, I didn't have a chance to compare the rule books. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. You're now allowed a heavy or cone style barrel on firearms with barrel lengths of 4.25 inches or less. And I think the rule used to be four inches or less. And, I, and I, my take on it is that when the, when the rule book was originally written, essentially all 4.25 inch uh, 1911s had bushing barrels, and those with barrels of four inches or less, almost all of those had bull barrels. And so the rules were written essentially to retain what at that time was the normal order of things amongst factory guns. If you had a shorter barreled gun, like an officer's model or a four inch compact that probably already came with a, a bull barrel, bull barrels were fine. But if you had a 4.25 inch gun, like a Colt Commander, um, you could not substitute uh, a bush or a bull barrel for the factory bushing barrel. You could put a new bushing barrel in there, but you couldn't put a bull barrel in. And now that's been ex extended that the full size commander barrel of 4.25 inches, you're now allowed to put a bull barrel in there. So I believe that is a change. Uh, you're free to scold me if I'm wrong about that. I have to learn this too. Uh, since the new rule book, uh, while the rule book was being considered, all safety officer training classes were suspended. And so, of course, now it's been about a year and we're getting clamoring, you know, can we get uh, some safety officer training? So I've got to learn all this stuff so I can teach it. Um, yeah, I've got to learn all this stuff so I can teach it. 
Um, I don't see a lot of changes in enhanced service revolver or stock service revolver. Still some little detail changes. I mean, there's some things in here about, um, for instance, if you're shooting a gun that's chambered in 357 Magnum, you can shoot 38 special ammo in it. Um, I know there were some rules that were specifically, uh, that specifically ban using shorter cartridge cases than the gun, than the gun is originally chambered for. It's kind of a convoluted sentence. Um, but the idea is it's easier to load, unload with a shorter overall cartridge length. So if you're shooting a 357 Magnum, um, you could uh, have a little bit easier time of it shooting 38 Special in your 357. Same thing, um, let's say if you had a revolver chambered in 10 millimeter, you could get something of an advantage if you were using 40 Smith & Wesson. And so in these specific cases, you're allowed to use the shorter case of a similar cartridge um, there's a limited number of uh, exceptions, but it is something that's specifically now written into the rules. Um, the weight limit in enhanced service revolver is 50 ounces. I think that's probably stayed the same. Um, you're allowed to load either with moon clips or um, speed loaders. That's remained the same. So there's just, it's, it's uh, not a whole lot of changes. SSR is the same, except you're limited, you're limited to speed loaders. You're not allowed to use moon clips. Um, same information regarding the use of the shorter cartridges. Um, the weight limit in SSR is 43. So again, uh, we're 43 across the board, it sounds like, except ESR, which is 50. Now, one of the cool changes is they've established some more uh, rules regarding backup gun. It used to be essentially the only requirement is that the gun uh, be loaded with five rounds. I mean, that's really all it was. Short barrel, three inches for revolvers, 3.8 inches for auto pistols, and then load five rounds. And as we were discussing in the backup gun episode we did a couple of years ago, you could shoot your X frame uh, 500 Smith & Wesson in backup gun division if you wanted to, as long as the barrel was less than three inches. Um, and so that's kind of a ridiculous backup gun, but it just shows you the, the breadth of, of the types of guns that were allowed. It really the only limits were barrel length. Um, and you could use extremely powerful cartridges if you want, but it allowed uh, less powerful cartridges, uh, sub nine millimeter. But they've uh, created some new backup gun rules that allow for, uh, not allow for, but just kind of uh, list the specifications, things that you can do in a backup gun match. And they didn't really expand it too much, um, but there's another new division, uh, or a, a kind of a division I'll get into in a minute, that will allow you to shoot your backup gun in a regular IDPA match, which I think was something that people wanted to do. If they had a gun, something like, say, uh, uh, five shot revolver and they had five speed loaders for it or you've got a Walther PPK and you've got five mags for it um, You couldn't always even if it were legal if the match weren't set up specifically to accommodate it You might have something like poppers that you wouldn't be able to activate if you shot them with a 32 or something like that so um, the backup guns are relegated really to either backup gun specific matches which took into account the lower power level or you had to set or going forward now, you'll, you could set up a match specifically to accommodate these pistols. For instance, no heavy poppers that are required for activating or something like that. You could use some other form of activation or just leave steel out of it, replace a popper with a plate that could be knocked over with a sub minor power factor gun. But your backup gun rules, pretty much the same um, in that it's the, the barrel length is the same, but it does say clubs may hold backup matches. Now this, this is actually new. Uh, clubs may hold backup gun matches where bug guns compete in specially designed courses of fire. Bug matches are club level only unless approved by headquarters. This allows semi-auto revolver shooters to compete equally by loading five rounds, etc., etc. And we already did that last year. We had a backup gun match and it was made up exclusively of five round courses of fire so that it were, you could fulfill all the requirements of backup gun, five shot strings, no on the clock reloads, etc. Um, but what's really cool, good segue, is a new division, if you can call it that, called Not For Competition. And the idea of the Not For Competition division is to allow a match director to set up a match 
and allow certain guns that wouldn't otherwise be IDPA legal to compete in a regular IDPA match. Now, I've already mentioned backup gun, so I, I've already asked my local match director for our club's October match, hey, would you allow sub-minor power factor guns in the October match? He seems to think it's okay. And so people who have sufficient mags and gear to shoot, say, a backup gun will be allowed to compete, and the match will be set up in such a way that they'll be able to compete. And that's the other thing. I think you probably don't want to show up at a match that you're not aware in advance is going to be able to accommodate, say, a sub-minor power factor gun for the reasons I already mentioned. So finding out in advance, or better still, uh, well in advance of the match, have ask and get the match set up specifically to accommodate a certain type of gun and then encourage people to shoot that type of gun. I mean, I think that's the thing that I enjoyed about the seeing this uh, not for competition division is that it will allow you, for instance, to say, okay, hey, this month we're going to allow any gun that doesn't fit in the box. So if somebody wants to bring their Desert Eagle or something to shoot the match, they can. Six inch uh, 1911s are pretty popular in USPSA competition. You could shoot that. Uh, guns that are too big, what's the Glock uh, 17L? I think it's a six inch gun, probably doesn't fit in the box. Guns like that that wouldn't normally be legal could be shot at the match under the new uh, not for competition division. And you could also do, as mentioned here, mentions right in the rule book, uh, so you could do a carry optics division. People are mounting, you know, mini red dots on their guns. You could do lasers, I suppose, I suppose, um, you know, just and score those people separately. So it really opens up the competition again in some cases to guns that are the real self-defense guns that people carry and that's that's the use to which i hope it's put i mean we, i've already seen a video on youtube of some guy drawing his uh, uspsa open race gun from underneath a vest and you could do that i mean if you've got a large group of uspsa shooters in your area and you want to try to attract them to a match say hey we're going to do uspsa open as our not for score division and uh, they can blast away. So whoever it is you want to please with that, if you're trying to attract people, you give a request, you could make all kinds of accommodations. I know we've done uh, revolver matches in the past and said, uh, for the purposes of this match, we're going to allow you to essentially shoot any revolver you have. And, and one of the ways we were able to get away with that was uh, we're not too far from the Canadian border. And up in Canada, they've got a special rule that allows them to shoot six inch barrels up there because you're not allowed to shoot uh, four inch barrels. And so they essentially would have very little revolver competition unless they were allowed to shoot a longer barrel. So we said for the purposes, we're gonna call this our international revolver match to allow people, because I've got a six inch 38 that I normally wouldn't be able to shoot. So it could be the same deal. You know, we're gonna allow long guns, heavy guns, Subcaliber. Um, you could set up. I know a buddy of mine wanted to set up a new division uh, called Snake Eater Division, and it would have like 200 power factor, and any gun that could make the power factor would fit. If you wanted to shoot a 10 millimeter, 357 Magnum, 44 Magnum, whatever, it would be, you know, way beyond major power factor, and exclusively for guns like that. So you could do that if you wanted to do that. But it's cool because it just allows you a lot of flexibility. And the guns still have to meet all the other requirements. I mean, they've got to, you have to use your strong side holster and you've got to use your, um, the reloads have to have the specified number of rounds in them and whatnot. But uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of stuff you could fit in there. And just for fun, I mean, I think there are uh, people well, they've got guns in the safe that they want to bring out and hey, it's not really legal. Like that's the case with the match we're going to have in October. I want to shoot my Luger. It's a 30 caliber Luger. doesn't make power factor, but under the not for competition rules, good to go. Um, so that's about it. That's about it for the equipment. I mean, in terms of guns, we're also going to talk about the changes uh, in future episodes. Uh, there's some changes for how you carry your equipment. Um, and of course, there's tons of detailed changes for uh, competition rules, and we'll get into that in future episodes. Uh, but that pretty much covers the, the important changes that have been made in the, in, the, in the gun rules. If you have any questions or comments, if I screwed something up or misconstrued something, uh, give us a call and uh, we'll discuss it. All right, trivia question. If you were listening, I mentioned multiple times that the weight limits in uh, divisions had changed. Pretty much everything had changed except, I think, uh, ESR and ESP. And I'd mentioned multiple times that the weight of 43 ounces was pretty much across the board weight limit except for one division. 
And so the trivia question is, which is the one division that does not have a 43 ounce weight limit and what is the weight limit of that division? So get those answers in. You can email us at powerfactorshow at gmail.com. The show is, of course, there at powerfactorshow.com. And if you're a Facebook person, you'll know how to find us on Facebook, or it'll probably be written down here across the bottom of the screen somewhere. So until next time, uh, I'm Rick, and we'll see you at the range. <laughs> Bam 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 b